So last season, I talked about Thomas and the Magic Railroad, a movie that, while flawed, had a lot of charm. The soundtrack was great, the Thomas parts we got were good. Notice how I said the parts we got? Because most of the movie was taken up by the Shining Time plot. We got to follow deranged Alec Baldwin, <laughs> blonde-haired beach guy, and sad old man as they try to find out why the magic is starting to disappear from their world. And sad old man also had this engine named Lady that he built who is a magic engine. And he's not just saying that because he's a show off off. It, okay, maybe a little, but also because she can travel on the magic railroad, hence the name. There's also this evil Diesel named Diesel 10 who tries to destroy her just because he's an a-hole, I guess. Who knows, that perfectly sums up this whole movie. It's just way too confusing, the movie gets ambitious with all the plots it has going on at once and it just doesn't flow very well. And that's how audiences felt, because after throwing almost 20 million dollars at this thing, they finally realized, Wait, is this actually good? Most people said no, and they stopped buying tickets, the movie flopped, and some were wondering where the franchise would head next. Well, eventually it would be there, but not yet. Season 5 came out the next year and just kind of ignored everything. No Diesel 10, no Mr. Conductor, although Alec Baldwin did narrate this season, and the next season, so that was pretty cool. And I can't really blame the filmmakers, I would have done the exact same thing if I was in their situation. That's why none of the new characters besides Diesel 10 really survived this movie, it just wasn't successful enough. Take the most popular one and just dump everything else. And surprisingly, the show didn't really take a dip in quality, season 5 was just as good as season 4, if not better in some aspects. After this, season and six came out, which was also good, it seemed like the franchise might be able to recover from Magic Railroad with no problems at all. I'm sorry, what did you say? Um, season seven is where things started to get a little questionable. Hit Entertainment bought out Ghislaine Entertainment, the studio that was previously in charge of the show. Brad Allcroft had been an executive producer since Magic Railroad, but she pieced out this season and a whole new crew was brought on. Don't you just love it when your old family disappears and you have to adjust to a completely new one? Don't answer, of course you do. Anyways, Brit was technically still on the show as script slash creative consultant, but she basically didn't have a say in much of what went on. And honestly, after being with the series for so long, she was kind of getting ready to try new ventures, so this would end up being the the final season with her involvement. David Mitten, another important figure in Thomas, he also helped shape the foundation of the show, uh, yeah, he left too. Luckily, it was towards the end of the season, after filming had ended, but he ended up only writing one episode out of the whole season, Toby's Windmill, which is coincidentally one of the best episodes of the season, in my opinion. Composers Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell also left after a legal dispute with Hits. The show was literally falling apart before people's eyes. Now, season seven is what I consider the last of the golden era of Thomas. I'm actually surprised surprised, even though Hit had some not-so-great changes in mind and there was a completely new crew. This season came out relatively unscathed, sure you can see some degradation in quality, but for the most part it fits right at home with the first six. But what were the not-so-great changes Hit had in mind for the show? What's this? Audience? Now that's better. They wanted to market the show towards kids. While it technically was a kids show before, it could be enjoyed by pretty much anyone. And honestly, I think a majority of the episodes weren't really written with kids in mind anyways. I think the writers were kind of in on it. I mean, half of the words they used in the show most kids probably didn't even understand. Like Little Timmy, what's a firebox? Um... Bacon. And they also never talked down to the kids. They were like, hey, we're not making excuses for you. If you can't understand any of this language or who these characters are, then you can just get out of here. Season 8 was when a lot of the changes started happening. That's where the show really started going downhill. And it was after this season where we finally get to calling all engines. This movie came out in between season 8 and 9, and you might be thinking, is this the production crew's second chance at a Thomas movie? Is it a sequel to Magic Railroad? Will it be even bigger and badder than that movie? No. no. First off, this is a TV special, not a theatrical movie, which means it's not as big of a deal as a movie. And no, it's not a sequel to Magic Railroad, although some Magic Railroad characters do appear in it. It's only an hour long, and it follows the same format as the TV show, so it feels a lot more like an extended episode rather than a movie. The story behind this special is it was made to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the franchise and the 20th anniversary of the show. Aren't even numbers amazing? I don't know if this is actually true, it kind of feels more like a lucky coincidence on hits part, but if that's not the reason, then my best bet was that it was made to market a bunch of toys. Really a shocking prediction, I know. It released in 2005, straight to DVD, which is the case for all Thomas movies going forward. Some were released theatrically in select countries, but in terms of a worldwide theatrical release, Magic Railroad is still the only Thomas movie to date that did that. The reception was pretty bad, as was the rest of the Hit Era episodes, mainly because again, it was aimed towards little toddler babies. But let's look at it and see if it's as bad as everyone says it is. 
because I haven't watched it in probably like five or six years, so let's see if it's how I remember it. I do remember most of the plot, I... I think. So let's see if anything's changed, hopefully, because I don't remember it being good. Ew! That's not great looking animation. I know it was 2005, but there was way better than that back then. That just looks gross. <laughs> yeah, you wish. Nope, instead we have the new theme song, which I don't hate, at least not this version of it. This is the version I listened to the most when I was a baby. Michael Brandon, we're gonna be listening to your voice for an hour. Well, I am, so you better make it count. The movie begins with this animated aerial shot that played at the beginning of every episode. I don't really like it. Like, we already had to sit through the theme song, now we gotta sit through this too? Just start the movie! We get a little title card, and it uses the most basic looking font ever. This special's got like three or four different logos they used, and it's just unnecessarily confusing. And yeah, I know this is the font used for the engine's numbers, but that doesn't make it any less lazy. Finally, we start the movie, and that's something I hated about this era of Thomas. These openings just dragged on forever, and they were all pretty much the same thing. It's always just stock footage of the engines driving by, and the narrator always goes, it was another beautiful day on the island of Sodor, or all the engines love to work hard on Sir Topham Hatt's railway. Let's see how this one opens up. Summertime is always beautiful on the island Island of Sodor. Yep, like I said, another beautiful day on the island of Sodor. It is a little different, but do you get my point? The narrator talks about how all the engines love to work hard on the island, and when the day's over, they love to relax at Tidmouth Sheds. Yeah, it's just the sheds. You don't need to spend this long talking about them. I swear they spend almost a full minute talking about them. Oh no, here comes Sir Topham Hat. You're all in trouble now. He tells them that a new airport's being built on the island, and the engines need to help out with it, and then BAM! Instantly, we're barely four minutes into the film, and they already hit us with a song. Thomas never had the best vocal songs, and this one is no exception. It's not very good. It's called Busy, and the voices are just kind of annoying. Thomas was never meant to be a musical, so I hate how many of these songs this era had. And the lyrics are kind of concerning. It talks about how they puff back and forth all day, and the engines are all dizzy, but they have to listen to Sir Topham Hat, so they have to keep going no matter what. Also, I like those pajamas. The song finally ends, and we see Percy and Thomas at the construction site, pushing a bunch of bricks. But Ari and Bert come up from behind them. If you don't know who they are, they were minor characters in the earlier model seasons, I always thought they were creepy. Their models were also repainted to be used to splatter and dodge in Magic Railroad, in fact in some production photos you can still see some of the stripes, though they're missing in the final film. They decide to ram right into Thomas and Percy, well that was a little rude, they were just sitting there. The narrator says this made them both very cross, that's another thing! During this era they loved using the word cross, I swear it was in every episode. What's this? Why did these borders suddenly appear? Thomas is a steam engine. Yeah, I kind of already knew that. He runs on coal. Again, I already knew that. It's not that much of a secret, really. Now here are Ari and Bert. Um, hi! Do they run on coal? Um, no, they run on diesel fuel. No, they run on diesel fuel. Yeah, I kind of just said that. Not like steam engines at all. No, they're two very different machines, and diesels replaced steam engines because they're better. When Thomas stops... He wishes steam. Yeah, he is a steam engine. Do Ari and Bert wish steam? No. Did you just reuse the same no sound clip? But sometimes they make nasty black smoke. D oh, come on, guys. It's not good to inhale smoke, and Thomas is right there. Did you hear that? It's a whistle. But what was that noise? Come on, you're an adult. You should know that's a horn. Steam engines and diesel engines really are very different. Yeah, what was the purpose of any of that? Oh, we're back to the regular episode now. Wait, what? Oh, I remember now. This was part of Hit's plan to make the show appeal to younger kids. Throw in these stupid learning segments. I remember seeing these as a kid, and I always hated them. All they did was pause the action, and now they're in this movie? And since it's longer than an actual episode, we'll probably have to see a lot more of them. Well, I won't mention them that much, unless there's something interesting in them. <laughs> like that's ever gonna happen. Anyways, back to the episode. We see Thomas running to Aryan Bird again, and this time he decides to get revenge by pushing their freight bed out of the way, and oh Thomas, look at the mess you made. This isn't a playground, this is a working, operating railway. They can't afford messes like that. You should be ashamed. How childish. Later, Thomas and Percy are at the docks when Devious Diesel stops by, and it's basically like, you won't screw around when I'm here, will you? If you do, I'll consume
consume your face and tear out your insides. Then he leaves. Man, already another learning segment? Well, in this one, Thomas wants to pull a prank on Diesel, and he has three freight cars to choose from. Wood, bricks, and bananas. Obviously, he chooses the bananas. I guess nobody realizes or cares that Diesel's hauling a freight car full of bananas? Thomas is pretty proud of himself, and later on, he and Percy are puffing to the scrapyard to pick up some scrap. But when they get there, there's somebody scary already there. You can probably already tell by those white stripes. It's Diesel 10. Yep, he's back from Magic Railroad. I don't really know what the story is. The movie isn't canon to the rest of the show, so is Diesel 10 just a random bully Diesel that showed up to the island one day? I guess so? Whatever. Thomas and Percy are scared and they puff away, but when they get back to the sheds, they're shocked by what they see. The entirety of Tidmouth Sheds has been destroyed since the Diesels were supposed to rebuild it, but they got delayed since a certain somebody decided to send bananas instead of wood or bricks. This means that the engines have to relocate to different places. James has to sleep at the coal plant, heh. <laughs> Edward has to sleep at the quarry with Diesel, just try not to die. Henry and Percy have to sleep at the smelter's yard, you're fine, Sir Topham Hat isn't gonna scrap perfectly working engines. Gordon has to sleep under a tent, <laughs> alright, now I just feel bad. And Thomas has to sleep at Knapford Sheds with Emily, and he's still feeling pretty guilty for what he did. Hey, you better watch it, Thomas, Emily doesn't seem too happy to see you. Thomas tries to speak, but Emily's like, shut your mouth and go to sleep. Yeah, she doesn't like sharing her shed. That night, a huge storm blows over the island and causes a lot of damage, most notably the suspension bridge. It tries to hang on, but eventually it goes bye-bye. And I gotta admit, this is a pretty cool shot. The fact that it's a real-life model being broken apart and the fact they likely only had one take to do this makes it a pretty impressive scene. I'm surprised they were able to pull it off. The next morning, Thomas goes to inspect the damage, and it's pretty bad. Sir Topham Hat tells all the engines they'll all have to work extra hard to fix everything on the island, which means the sheds will have to wait until everything else is done. And then we get another learning segment. This time we have to decide which jobs the engines will be the best at. Okay. Satan's CFO, Satan's advisor, a high school janitor. Harvey goes to pick up some branches on the line, Henry and Edward go to the airport to drop off some lumber, and Thomas picks up some workers in Annie and Clarabelle, his coaches, woo. Anyways, tensions are heating up with the steamies and diesels, none of them are talking to each other at all. Then Thomas runs into Diesel 10 again, and he's really scared of him in his claw, so he puffs away. Yeah, you're scared of him in his claw, so how about you run right beside him and almost get hit by his claw? You know, you're really smart, Thomas. That night, Thomas tries to talk with Emily again, but again, she's like, shut up and die. We get another song, this one is called Trying, and it's about how the Steamies think they're better than the Diesels, and the Diesels think they're better than the Steamies. I would be sort of interested in this conflict, except I already know how it ended. Thomas arrives at the harbor to carry this flatbed of metal, but it's a lot heavier than he anticipated, and it takes some effort to push it. We get another learning segment, I Wanna Die, and then we see Thomas trying to lower the steel beam onto the suspension bridge. He struggles way too much with it, but eventually he gently places it down, and the workmen cheer because they love having other people do their manual labor. Whoa! Diesel's pretty mad, though, because Thomas is getting all the attention, so later on, when Thomas is collecting paint, he rams right into him, and the paint goes flying all over him. This island has so many damn accidents, how is it not shut down already? What shady things are you doing, Topham? <laughs> Don't ask. And this kick starts a whole series of accidents. Thomas hits Airy, so Airy hits James, and Gordon hits Bert, Diesel hits Toby, and I thought Toby was about to die. I thought this was like a grinder or something, but nope, he just kind of hangs out there and doesn't fall for some reason. Airy pushes Henry into some oil, so Henry pushes Diesel into this mud like a high school bully. He's like, get in there, nerd. Sir so Topham Hat's pretty upset, and he's just like, please, for once, stop trying to ruin my plans. But it's too late, because he tells them now the airport won't get finished in time, so the island won't get any visitors that summer. I guess that's a bummer, even though there's still cars and boats, but hey, at least now the engines will have more time to be jerks. Later, the engines all dream about what's going to happen to them. James dreams he gets turned into a carnival attraction, and all the kids, and even frickin' Sir Topham Hat start throwing balls at him. Gordon thinks he'll get turned into a playground toy, okay, but that would actually be a pretty fun toy. Imagine climbing all over him and playing conductor, that would have been the coolest thing as a kid. The weirdest one is Percy, he thinks he'll become a roller coaster, and why is he wearing those weird goggles? Thomas starts to dream about how he can make things right, and guess who appears to give him advice? None other than Lady. She and Diesel 10 are the only two characters for Magic Railroad to ever be brought back. And this was the only time they used her again, so this is the last time she ever appeared in the series. Just like Diesel 10, I don't know her backstory in this canon, the narrator just says she's a very special engine that works high in the mountains. Rusty is there too, and Lady tells Thomas they need to work together to fix all their problems. So Thomas decides to go get Mavis, since she's the only nice Diesel on the whole island. He eventually finds her at the washdown, they 
inside to schedule a meeting, and they go throughout the whole island, and they tell all the engines and diesels. The only one that doesn't get told is Diesel 10, because Thomas is too afraid, yet we know this is like the third time you've told us, we get it by now. Thomas is too lazy to go back to Emily's shed, so he decides to sleep on this random siding he found. At first, Emily's glad he's gone, stupid tank engine, puh. But after realizing it's too quiet, she starts to miss him, yawn, don't care, just take me to the meeting. All the engines and diesels gather at the coaling plant, and the plant manager wonders why they're all there. Yeah, don't these trains have schedules to keep? They can't just decide to not do their jobs, and they're frickin' trains, so they can't just take time off work. But this is the hit era of Thomas, honestly anything goes at this point, who cares, nobody. Sir Topham Hat is eating a cream donut, that's not me assuming, they literally say it. Sir Topham Hat was sitting down to eat his cream donut. Kind of a specific reference, you could've just said he was eating breakfast, or just said he was eating a donut, not that it matters, I just think it's funny how specific it is. Thomas is running a little late, and because of this, the Steamies and Diesels start to fight, but luckily he arrives right as things are getting bad. He tells them that the engines and diesels need to work together to build the airport, and oh wow, that was way too easy. Sir Topham Hat shows up and is like, why aren't you all working? Thomas tells them they're all gonna work together, and he says, yeah, but you still left all your jobs, I hate all of you. We get another terrible learning segment that goes on forever, it lasts for almost five minutes. Eventually, they're able to get the airport built, look how nice it looks, we got pea yellow, smushed peas green, and the blood of my enemies red, wonderful colors. The airplane's on its way, they must be going through some turbulence right now, because that's a pretty bumpy ride. But Thomas is an idiot, which is kind of a theme with this movie. The trucks he's pulling derail and hit the water tower, and it falls and cracks the runway, and the tracks are blocked. Now what are they gonna do? Well, time to head to the new playground that they built. The workmen finish the runway, but they need George the Steamroller to finish the job, but Thomas can't get George to them because the tracks are still blocked, and the workmen hate doing work themselves. So instead, Thomas decides to go get Diesel 10. He tries to talk to him, but he kinda just growls like a bear. <sighs> now, is that how we talk to people, Diesel 10? Look, we've been roommates for a while, and I I've known you, and I've really gotten to know you, and I really like you, you're a great person, and I... I got some feelings that I need to get out. What are you, what are you doing? Ah. Stop ah. it! <laughs> After some bribing and telling him he'll be the most useful engine on the island, Diesel 10 finally agrees to help and he and Thomas head to the airport. He starts clearing the tracks and it just feels wrong to see Diesel 10 actually smile. He never smiled in Magic Railroad except for his little evil granny did, but this is the first time we see him have a genuine happy smile and it's cursed, I hate it. Thomas is able to bring George the steamroller, he finishes the runway and all the engines celebrate when the plane arrives and then we get another song called Teamwork. It's fine, just forgettable like all the songs in this movie, they all sound exactly the same. That night, the engine returned to the sheds and discovered there's another berth because Sir Topham Hat's moving in. How else is he gonna make sure they stop fighting? Nah, actually, Emily is moving in, so she won't have to sleep alone anymore. Maybe if Emily was a more interesting character, I would care more, but she's just okay. Whatever, we get the engine roll call at the end. The end! After watching it again, calling all engines is way worse than I remember it. It has some cool parts, Diesel Town is cool to see again, and the technology in his claw is way more advanced this time they were actually able to get it to do a lot more movement, so that's pretty cool. The wide range of characters is cool, and the modern versions of the show, they don't have this much variety, it's usually just Thomas, and it kinda gets boring after a while. But here, pretty much all the characters we've seen throughout the series appear. The props are also cool. Seeing the suspension bridge collapse is awesome, and the water tower crashing is cool as well. And that's it! Honestly, if I had to sum up Calling All Engines, it would just be boring. I actually added up all the time taken up by the three songs, the learning segments, and the opening and closing theme, and it totaled up to be roughly 20 minutes! Almost half the runtime taken up by absolutely nothing. You could cut out all the learning segments, songs, everything, and you really wouldn't lose much. Sure, the learning segments do explain some parts of the plot, which was a stupid decision on Hit's part, because that means you can't cut them out in future versions, they are a part of the movie. And man, do they really screw up this movie's rating. If you could remove those songs and learning segments, I would like this way more. I would love to see an edited version of this movie with all that cut out, because honestly, who cares if little things aren't explained, plenty of other stuff isn't explained anyways, like Diesel 10's backstory, but that still wouldn't completely save this movie because it's honestly just boring in general. There's so many shots of the engines just puffing along the tracks. The narrator talks way too much and there's so many boring dialogue sections that drag on for way too long. I think the idea to focus on Steamies versus Diesels isn't terrible. Of course, I liked it more in the original series where only certain Diesels were bad, but there were a lot of nice ones. And it does kind of make sense for them to hate each other 
since the diesels are trying to replace the steamies, and that didn't turn out too well. I also like how they don't paint one side in a good light, and one in a bad light. Sure, the diesels do start it, but the steamies decide to be jerks back, and they both end up causing a bunch of damage. But I feel like they only put it in because the executives thought it would be a good message. It's sort of like racism for kids. It feels like that's why they did it, rather than actually having a cool story idea for it, and that's probably why the movie feels so barren, because nobody really had any good ideas. And honestly, just feels like a really long episode, and that's what it should have been. This episode could have easily been chopped up into an episode, cut out all the filler, change a few scenes, you probably wouldn't even have to do that. And you could easily get this down to a nice 20 minutes with 10 minutes left for your ads. They even reused the same theme song and end song from the show, so that makes it even easier. Is it worse than Magic Railroad? In my opinion, yes, way worse. Thomas and the Magic Railroad looks like the Godfather compared to this. That movie had a good score with good songs, the plot also isn't very good, but it's at least entertaining. When I watch Magic Railroad, I don't feel bored, I just feel frustrated. Plus, that movie feels like an actual movie, and while that movie feels like it's trying to do too much, this feels like it's doing too little. And honestly, I'd rather have too much than too little in my movie. I'd say on the Zack Attacker movie Raider, I'll give it a 3 out of 10. There's just no reason to watch it. While this isn't the worst version of Thomas, it's definitely not ideal. And I grew up with this era of Thomas and the CGI era. And I still hate them! That just goes to show you how not good this movie, or this entire era of the show is. Not even someone who grew up with them can defend them. Even as a kid, I felt like this era was just boring. Well, that experiment failed, what are you gonna do now, Hit? Perfect.